Radar stations detected incoming attacks from the south coast to Yorkshire. The huge formations were split up by ferocious counterattacks. Despite the heavy damage sustained by some southern aircraft factories and airfields, the total damage on the ground was out of all proportion to the number of German bombers involved. The day that was supposed to be the beginning of Britain's downfall turned out to be a rout. German losses were massive. To the Luftwaffe, it became known as Black Thursday. Fighter command's losses were also high. In fact, the total losses on both sides that day were never to be exceeded in the battle. Our normal day would consist of taking off from our airfield at North Weald in the Epping Forest, flying down in the dark to an aerodrome which is close to the south coast. There we would refuel and if we could get a, a little bit of sleep because we'd taken off probably at four o'clock in the morning. While we were there we'd get our breakfast brought down to us. Then the scramble alarm would be given fairly shortly afterwards. It became almost a routine and dash out your aircraft and you could go from being fast asleep to being up in the air in under two minutes. As you were climbing up and doing your cockpit checks, the controller would give you over the radio the height you had to climb to, the distance to the enemy aircraft that were coming in, their altitude, and um, probably their compass direction as well. And with the aids of radar, uh, these interceptions were spot on every time. After you run out of ammunition, you would peel off and dive down to the nearest uh, fighter airfield. We knew them all very well. Then the ground crews would rearm the aircraft, refuel them, and this they could do in about 15, 20 minutes. And then you would be off again. Well, we'd done our routine thing of flying down to an airfield near South End called Rochford. We took off from there in the afternoon to intercept a raid coming in, which we were told had about 90 aircraft and about 60 uh, bombers with a fighter escort. So our job was to attack the bombers, and as I was attacking them, uh, there were only 10 of us, as I was attacking them, I was bounced by the fighters, and uh, my aircraft suddenly exploded on fire, and uh, I had to get out but rapidly. They reckon the temperature in the cockpit goes up from room temperature to about 3,000 degrees centigrade in under 10 seconds. So if you're not out in a 10-second period, you're never going to get out. But with magnificent RAF training, you instinctively go through all the drills to get yourself out of the aircraft rapidly. I was tumbling head over heels, but managed to get my very badly burned hand onto the ripcord and pull the uh, release for the parachute. A couple of seconds later the parachute had opened. Immediate reaction was to look up and see if the parachute was on fire, but fortunately it wasn't. And then I took stock of the situation. I was floating down from about 15,000 feet. As I looked down at the water far below, I noticed that my trousers had been blown off. My right shoe had been blown off and I could smell this rather nauseating stench of my own burnt flesh which wasn't very attractive so the next thing that happened as I floated down shock I suppose set in I started to shiver with the cold and the shock and then suddenly um, the water came up I went into that and then I was horrified to see that the parachute was coming down on top of me like a mushroom I knew if I didn't get away from that uh, very quickly, I would be uh, enshrouded by the chute and uh, inevitably drowned. But um, when you're in that sort of situation, you struggle. So I got out from under the parachute. I could just see the English coast several miles away, so I set out in that direction. And then a little later, um, a vessel called the Trinity House put off a little dinghy with two men in it, and they came up and were rowing round me, just asking questions. Well, I'd had about half an hour of swimming, and I was a bit exhausted. And uh, they said, are you 
English or are you German? So at that point, I lost my temper and I used every four-letter word I could think of, at which point they realized I was an RAF officer. Over the weeks that followed through to the early autumn, pilots on both sides displayed tremendous skill and courage. In spite of all their efforts, the Germans had not managed to secure air superiority. Without this, Operation Ceylon was postponed, as it turned out, indefinitely. The RAF had, by the narrowest of margins, contained the greatest air force the world had yet seen. 461 RAF pilots had been killed out of a total force of just less than a thousand. 915 aircraft had been destroyed. Post-war Luftwaffe figures revealed the Germans had lost 1,733 aircraft. The hurricane had proved itself in battle. Despite the proposed tactics of leaving the German fighters to the Spitfires, this hadn't always happened in the heat of battle. It was found, though, that the hurricane with its broad wing could outturn both the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt 109 at combat altitudes. Its rugged airframe could sustain far more damage than any other fighter. These factors, together with it being a very stable gun platform, combined to make it the most successful fighter of the battle. I was responsible for, uh, for rearming all the aircraft on our flight. Uh, at the, the first aircraft we got were the eight 303 machine gun aircraft. So you had four 303 Browning machine guns in each wing. Uh, the next, after several operations up and down the desert, we, we were returned to base to re-equip with, with newer aircraft and we got the 12 gun Hurricane fighter. That had six machine guns in each wing. The bank of four here and two outboard on each wing. And then ultimately the Hurricane was, was developed of course because of its very deep cord wing it could accept the 20 millimeter cannon very easily without putting the blisters on the top or underneath as you have to do with a Spitfire. So the Hurricane became a very good aircraft in that, on that score. In the first campaign against the Italians, we moved forward very fast up through the desert. The Hurricane proved to be a very successful aircraft with this gypsy-like sort of movement because of its, it, its robust undercarriage and robust construction bearing in mind that we were moving every three or four days in some cases, so much so that we split the squadron in two and would leapfrog each other over, going right up through the desert in, into Libya, and then through right through Libya. And, and then, of course, we, we were halted when the Germans beefed the Italians up a bit, and we had to re retreat then. And we retreated at an even faster rate in some cases, going back into Egypt again. But all the time we were able to keep our aircraft, we'd stop and rearm on rough desert airstrips that were, all they all did was, was clear them of the larger stones and boulders, and they were taking off in all sorts of conditions and places. After battle damage, they were much more easily repaired than the, uh, than the Spitfire, with the, the wooden frame fuselage and and the uh, dope fabric for covering, they were able to be repaired after quite extensive damage on their own unit and turned round and back in the air again much more quickly than the Spitfire squadrons were because the, the Spitfire with the stress metal skin invariably had to go back to the, fa to the factories or the maintenance units for repair. When the Hurricane's planned life as a fighter had virtually come to an end in 1942, the introduction of yet another wing was to rejuvenate this remarkable aircraft. Known as the 2D, the aircraft was now armed with two 40mm Rolls-Royce BF or Vickers Type S anti-tank guns, plus two harmonized .303 machine guns for sighting. 